Welcome to Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall. From consumer preferences to growing a company, I'm excited to have David Moore and Andy Joint of Big Grove Brewing on the show this week. As the brewery expands through Iowa and is now eyeing other states, we're going to talk about flavors and creativity and finding ways to stay nimble in a challenging industry. But first, please go visit allaboutbeer.com. There you can find original articles, reviews, news, insights, and podcasts. Listen to shows like Brewer to Brewer, the All About Beer podcast, and Beer Travelers, simply by searching All About Beer wherever you listen to shows. This show and all of the work we do, it's supported by you. Please go visit patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. A few bucks goes a long way to help keep the content fresh and to fund writers, photographers, creators, and editors. If you'd like to learn more about advertising on this show or any of our shows, please email info at allaboutbeer.com. Speaking of that, you know that's the sound of another sale on your online Shopify store. But did you know Shopify powers selling in person too? That's right. Shopify is the sound of selling everywhere, online, in store, on social media, and beyond. Take customers from picking it out to picking it up. Shopify syncs in-store inventory with Google, so when local customers search for that thing that they want that you have, bam, you're there. Demand meets supply. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash drinkbeer. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash drinkbeer to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash drinkbeer. During my recent visit to Iowa, I spent a delightful afternoon at Big Grove, which began its existence in the eastern part of the state and has recently expanded into Des Moines. It was a lively afternoon at the brewery. With a concert in town, the tap room was filled to the brim with customers getting a pre-show meal in as well as multiple pints. The service was on point. The patrons were happy, and it was the kind of scene that is possible when a company has its eye on proper service and execution. To talk about growth, recipes, and managing all of the different parts of a business, I'm joined by Andy Joint and David Moore. Joint has been the director of beer for Big Grove Brewery for seven years and became an owner in 2020. He's responsible for all of the beer that is made at Big Grove's five different operations that includes two production facilities as well as three smaller taproom breweries. Under his leadership, Big Grove has become the number one top-selling craft beer in Iowa, surpassing Blue Moon and Line and Kugels. Big Grove has also captured multiple awards, including World Beer Cup, GABF, and the U.S. Open of Beer Medals. Moore spent the first six years at Big Grove as the chief operations officer and also became an owner in 2020. He recently became the chief growth officer, where he oversees the company's advancement into new markets for tap rooms, distributions, as well as new business divisions. He's also the CEO and owner of Climbing Kites, Iowa's first and top selling THC infused beverage company. Here's our conversation. What was the original plan for Big Grove and how does it square with where you are now? I mean, the way it started was, you know, we were talking before we hopped on here about Big Grove uh, was kind of a a restaurant group that wanted to get into craft beer. And they had a place called Red's Ale House uh, in North Liberty, Iowa, where they were, it was the best craft beer bar in Eastern Iowa. And it became the launch pad for a lot of big brands, but they wanted to start making their own beer. And so that's when they started the the Big Grove concept. And originally it was just going to be kind of a brew pub, a small format, uh, really uh, high-end food and high-end beer coming out of the back. And that was kind of where we jumped off with Big Grove. There's been a lot of hospitality groups that have gotten involved with and restaurant groups that have gotten involved with beer over the years. Some have been successful uh, for quite a while and then maybe, you know, lost their way over over time. you know, some have not been successful. Uh, but when you talk about like high quality beer and food, like I think for a long time, a lot of those restaurant groups were okay. Like, are we an Applebee's with a Pico system in the back? Um, right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we should have, food. You're right, <laughs> we should have food. <laughs> Just so, <laughs> um, but, but to immediately come out and say, okay, like you wanted an elevated concept, um, but then to stick with it, I imagine is, is sometimes easier said than done. 
Is, is, is that fair? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's always a challenge. Um, you know, one of the big, big strokes of luck and developments for Big Grove was when they opened that Solon brew pub location, the original spot there. Uh, they were able to track down a chef, Ben Smart, who's our, our culinary director now. He was out in Seattle working at the herb farm and had been for like five years. Okay. And he was kind of looking for a change. And they were able to bring him back to Solon, a town of 2,000 people, to open this, this brew pub concept. And so he brought some really high-end food concepts with him. And w- between what he had in his arsenal and then, you know, Matt Swift, the, the CEO's kind of focus was on more... I don't know, kind of sports bar and, and, and more kind of everyday food, they kind of were able to create a really cool menu together. Um, and throw in Doug Getch, uh, who was another guy who spent some time in California at the CIA, the, the Culinary Institute out there. Yeah. The three of them just create some really, really fun menus that are approachable for people that want them to be that. Or if you want to get onto the fringes of the menu and find some just like dynamic international style foods, you know, they've got you covered there as well. Is it a tough sell or is it because for a long time when I think about brew pub concepts, right, it was, OK, we're going to have the fish and chips. We're going to have a, an OK burger. Uh, you know, we're going to have you know, the nachos or, you know, it was always sort of like pub food with then just, you know, the house made beer. But looking through the menu um, in, in advance, like there are elevated concepts here like you have all of that but it's also you know speaking to folks who might be a little bit more discerning and certainly in the instagram age um look a lot nicer than just plastic baskets and paper kind of thing um but is it a tough sell it has it been hard to, to reconcile with folks of like yeah we're a brew pub but don't think of us that way i would say a little bit i mean, i think like in, in solon they would speak to the fact that uh that uh, elevated menu didn't land uh, right away. It took probably six, eight months or so before it really kind of landed with people. They, they contemplated, I believe, a couple times uh, bringing that menu down, that level down a little bit to maybe meet people there type deal. And, and uh, they stuck to it, and people started to kind of circle away. And, you know, they, they, they came for the burger, and then they, I will try the Poke Bowl. I will try the this. I will try that. And then... Uh, it's always been executed at really high level, and so people realize that's just as quality as that. If you like it, you're going to love it, type deal. And and people start falling in love with certain things. And and, and like I said, people love our wings. Right? There's no denying that we we sell a lot of wings, uh, but we do a lot with other international dishes that really that really bring people uh, from all walks. You know. Uh, whether you're a foodie or not, and you, you, you'll find something you, you'll love here. So I th- if I it is just, a high-end burger if it is something like that. I was going to say, I think Ben and Doug went about it the right way, too, where they were approaching a lot of, using a lot of local farms and a lot of local ingredients, which, you know, there we had right around that Soul and Brew Pub. And so it's it, it helps connect that for people that maybe don't find some of those more extravagant dishes approachable. It's like, well, you know, we got this from Kroll Farms. It's it's 20 minutes down the road. And yeah. Matt Kroll brought it in, you know, earlier this week. And you start to break down those barriers and get people into that that way. Do people come here first for the beer or first for the food? I think they come for the beer, but I'm um, the brewer. So. <laughs> <laughs> I would say when we came to, when we came to uh, Des Moines in particular, uh, this location, I, it was the beer. And most people knew us by the beer. Um, you know, they either, uh, you know, we, we sold beer here. We distributed beer here before we came here. Yeah. And so they knew of us there. I would say probably leaving Solon and going into like Iowa City, which was our first larger spot. Um, I think probably, well, I would say a, a mix of both. Uh, but the, the beer was what, what gave us, um, I would say, the confidence to expand. Uh, it wasn't the, the food. Food is part of it, part of the whole story. But we talk about the beer part of it. The beer is the reason why we expanded. It moved to Iowa City, moved to Solon, or I'm sorry, uh, Des Moines. Yeah. Moved to Cedar Rapids. It's because of the beer. So, uh, I would, I would, yes. He's biased, yes, but I think he's correct. Well, I mean, me and the sh- I joke with Chef Ben a lot because my objective every day is to brew beers and for our team to brew beers that, that bring people into the space. And I want them to come to Big Grove because they want the beers we're making. And I think Ben approaches it the same way when he's making food and his teams are making food. So hopefully it's a win-win for people that come in to see us. What do people want these days, beer-wise? You know, it seems to be shifting rather quickly right now. Um, you know, we still we still see a lot of attention to hazy IPAs and hazy double IPAs, still getting a lot of attention with those and, and getting some action. But I do think, you know, as much as brewers and, and the industry has talked about lager and West Coast IPA kind of coming back, 
it does really feel, at least for us uh, around here, that we're starting to see that on the consumer side, where they are drinking lager. They are actually seeking out some West Coast IPAs. So I think from, uh, from a brew staff perspective, we're excited to see that. Does that translate into like retail sales to you know grocery store? Like what, what like what's moving yeah, outside our of the number, I mean, our number one seller is called Easy Eddie, and it's a it's a hazy IPA, six uh, percent. Uh, so it's not double or like that. Um, but that's our that's our number one. Seller. It's a number one selling IPA in the state. Um, that's by far our biggest mover. Number two would be Citrus Surfer, uh, would be number two, uh, and again it's a fruited wheat. Um, so those are I mean going by what's in the market. Uh, those would be it. Then probably fruited sours is probably our next biggest mover. Uh, after that, we've got some heavily fruited sours, um, usually in the lower ABV style. Uh, and then I'd say probably the next package would probably be our variety pack. We have a Easy Eddie variety pack. Okay. Um, so that high fi you're drinking on the West Coast we, is found in that package only. Okay. Uh, as an example, um, we have probably six other quote unquote core brands that are out there as well. Um, but those those numbers are. I say plateaued at best, um, with the hopes that maybe if it picks up another style, people pick that up, they'll be back again. Yeah, it's so funny to hear you say plateaued at best, right? Because the uncertainty in the industry right now, what everybody is going through, like plateau is actually kind of success at the moment. For some of the brands, yeah, they, they've been yeah. around for you know, you know six, seven years now. So, I mean, there's always a maturation to about anything, uh, but uh, I think those in particular. Uh, for us, we seem pretty happy with it, right? And and people, then we have people that love those brands. That's, that's their brand. That's where they want to go to. We don't necessarily want to take that away. Even though it's, sometimes it's probably better if we did. If you want to look in the, you pull back thirty thousand feet. Look economically speaking, it probably makes sense to move on to some of those. But uh, we haven't done that fully. We've done it a couple times already. Um, but uh, the ones we have, people like I said, people love. So, but we'll, I mean, even if we do, we'll bring them back in the in the tap rooms. People will be able to find them in the tap room, for example. Maybe may on the store shelf. Yeah. Um, but that'll be it'd be hard to take some of those brands down. When I think about, there's like nine different avenues I want to go down with you guys right now. But um, having been back here in Iowa for the last couple of days now and going around. There is an enormous amount, at least in the circles that I'm hanging out in, of local beer pride. And I don't know if I necessarily have seen it in other states. Um, I'm seeing a lot of Bush. I'm seeing a lot of Modelo. Um, and I see that everywhere. But alongside it, I'm seeing locally made beer. And I'm seeing people have clear preferences for making their beer decisions for what's made in the state. Um, where in New Jersey, like you'll see people bouncing around all over the place, even in Massachusetts, California, other places like that. Um, I'm not asking you to speak for the whole state, but I'm asking you to speak for the whole state. Um, what is it about, you know, I'll call it homerism, but, and I mean that in a good way, um, that you're seeing with those, with those drinkers, with those, with those customers. It's a jump ball. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, I was a small, small population state, but it's a lot of people that, that have lived here, you know, were born here or maybe went out and saw some other areas in the country and, and ended up back here. And, and there is a lot of pride, you know, um, and I think it was always an objective for Big Grove to hopefully be a brewery that, that the state was proud of and wanted to take to their friends in other places and, and maybe show it off and, and be like, here, here's what we've got. You know, this is our brewery. Yeah. So, I, you know, it feels like we've been embraced and a lot of Iowa breweries have been embraced that way and it's just created a, a pretty tight culture that way. Yeah, I would, yeah I, would, I would agree with that. The, I think... I also think we're making some good beers too. I think I think that's part. It's, it's got to be part. People are, are proud to a point, but will they continue to buy if it's if it's sub, sub quality, right? If it's if it's not meeting the value that they see on the shelf, uh, if they're going to spend money on doing it. Yeah. Um, so uh, again, we're, we talk about this point. Uh, we're not going to be perfect, but I still think there's something there in the sense of if if you are able to produce a quality product, and the fact that people know it's a quality product and it's from their home state. Iowa in particular seems to be uh, a okay raising their hand saying yeah I'll, I'll pay maybe a dollar or two more six pack for something from you know uh, down the street yeah how has the hazy evolved how has Big Eddie evolved over 
its so, lifetime. So, I mean, Easy Eddie, we started, Easy Eddie, I'm we sorry, started at our, yeah. at our Solon brew like, pub. I almost went with Crazy Eddie, which was an East Coast <laughs> thing, but yeah. It's, yeah, we, so so it's, yeah. it's funny that you say it. We do have a big Ed, actually. A, it's a hazy double IPA that's okay. coming out next week. But okay. <laughs> Easy Eddie is kind of the core that, yeah. that, that moves the needle for us, for sure. Um, you know, it, we started early on when, when Hazy was like, it was happening. It was more on the East Coast. So people were like, what is this? Um, we messed around with it a lot at our at our pilot facility in Solon, yeah. just trying to figure it out. I didn't really understand the objective at the time because everybody talked about hazy. I'm like, oh, you know, that's you the throw point. flour into it, and right. we're putting oats, and like, yeah, it's just yeah, playing but, the pounds per barrel game, right? Yeah, yeah and, which and, was like six years ago, and it seems like a fucking like lifetime ago, but yeah, it's yeah. But we played with it a bunch of times, and we really took our time with it, wanting to get that recipe figured out. We brought it down to our Iowa City, our production location there. We started making some 30-barrel batches of it um, and just really tweaking it. And it was in there with some of, the, some of the equipment and the technology we had where we were able to really get that recipe where we wanted it. And, so, and we also kind of realized that the haze wasn't what we were pursuing. It was that hot profile that the hazy features, right? It's a softer bitterness. It's a juicier, just more pungent kind of trap experience and once we found what our real goal was I think that's when we got Easy Eddie to where we wanted it to be but we actually one of the things we did along the way that I think helped us and helped Eddie was we started centrifuging it pretty early on so we started cleaning it up and it was it was a moment for me as a brewer where I was like I was really nervous about it because it seemed to go against what we were trying to do but I, I, you know, if you've ever watched a centrifuge run, when they eject, you know, they eject out all this liquid. Yeah. Well, we used to eject it into a bucket before it hit the drain. So I reached into that bucket and I just grabbed some of what had been ejected and I tasted it. And I'm like, yeah, we don't want that in the beer. It was bitter and just, you know, not pleasant. And after we started doing that, that was when like Eddie just really started to hit the mark for us. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I'll, I'll back up on the, on the, so the backside of the consumer. Um, it's our, you know, hands down our number one selling beer. I told you, we, yeah. we make about, you know, 30,000 barrels of beer a year. And Eddie is probably, so I think it's about 60% of that. 60% yeah. of that. So, uh, yeah. and so it's not just beer people, right? It's not just, it's people who, right. Who yeah. You're not going to be like, actually, I, I kind of like this. It, it's, it's, I can drink this type deal. And that, that's, that's when the snowball uh, happened. Uh, for us, when we really saw that brand really explode, thankfully we had a cool name. Thankfully we picked some cool colors. We picked the right it became, color. <laughs> it became our, our, our the, you know, the brand that's most associated with us. Yeah. Uh, but thankfully, thankfully, organically, well, can, some like can, happen. can aesthetics and, and marketing aesthetics like, are very important oh, in this game. Yeah. yeah. If, we, if, if we had a, you know, um, I don't want to make some. I'll say a name of a beer, and that's gonna be somebody's beer name. But it's, right, say, yeah. say it's a terrible name, and right. you know, and it's like, do you remarket it? Do you now? What do you do? Type deal and. And uh, so, thank a lot of things happened for us that, that really worked, and and uh, Easy Eddie is just like I said, Blum. It's not because just of the beer beer guys. It's 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 everybody. Every every can really enjoy that beer, and they find it they find it very approachable. I think yeah. I think that you know back to the centrifuging, it added a drinkability to that beer that maybe wasn't in a lot of that style at the time because there wasn't there wasn't anything residual in there. So it was like it drank pretty clean. And so people were, uh, that was the joke from my friends. Like, yeah, I crack an Eddie, you know, I brought a six pack home and I, I looked at the end of the night and I'm like, it's gone. I'm like, what happened? It's gone. <laughs> that was, you know, I think part of Eddie's magic early on too. And, and, and I've said this before, but I, I, I'm annoyed when I hear brewers, so not you guys, but um, like call it idiot proof. Like, oh, it, it, hazy is the simplest thing to make. You just get your, you know, it hop of the moment and you put a couple of pounds per barrel in and people are going to pay 20 bucks a four pack and it's going to be great and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, no, it, they're going to catch on to you sooner rather than later. And the ones who really figured it out, you know, like you guys with the centrifuging, like early on, like Trillium and Treehouse and the Alchemist and all of these places, like they had their own approach to it where there's a lot of this industrial work that went into making making it better and that's i think one of the reasons one you guys are successful but also those other brands versus some of the other ones that might just be kind of middling with yeah yeah, yeah i mean and that was maybe nice aesthetic but not yeah not as not as approachable or drinkable I, yeah I, yeah no, that was part of the joke too the name was you know when we were explaining the name easy eddy because oh it's easier for the brewers to make because they don't have to filter it and it's just easy and it's actually honestly the hardest beer that we make it takes longer in the brew house it takes more specialty ingredients and yeah it's harder to execute well um 
because you've been thinking about Hazy's and the growth that it's helped with the brewery, have you been thinking about where the future of that style might be headed? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, you know, when something comes on that strong and sort of overwhelms, you you always wonder if it's going to be just like rise and then it just falls right back to the ground. Immediate crater, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I, from my personal opinion is that I think with what, where, you know, you mentioned some breweries that do it really well. And yeah. I think where, where some of the hazies have gotten to, I think it's a style that will, will be there forever. Just, Agreed. You know, oh, I don't think it's a fad yeah. by any means. I, I, think I some might of, have dismissed it early on as, yeah. Some of the wild edges that we kind of pushed early on might be something that sort of we, we, we kind of, you know, recede or trace back to more of a, I don't know, whatever, kind of a easier to approach beer. But I think it'll be around. But, I, you know, what's, what's going to come next? What's, where's that IPA drinker headed with their palate the next, you know, for the next beer? Yeah, but, lagers. Yeah, 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 it's that's <laughs> the hope. <laughs> it is, it is absolutely the hope um, yeah. at this point. But you guys are doing that as well. I mean, you're 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 doing a lot of R and D. You're making, you're meeting people where they want to be, even outside of the craft. You know, audience. Yeah. You talk. You should talk about Cedar Rapids. That's coming out. You'd, you'd probably enjoy that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we talked, we're in Des Moines. I mentioned the guys in Des Moines like Bruin Lager. Uh, We're actually, we are building a facility in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, which is over in Eastern Iowa as well. And it's going to be lager focused. So it's a, it's a 15 barrel brew house that we bought. It was from a a Gordon Biersch location that closed down. Okay. So speaking of another restaurant company that made a foray into, yeah but knew it was a brew house built for making lager. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, I was, I got the chance to go to Germany not too long ago and, and see, you know, I'm, I'm f- sure you're familiar with Schoenraum there uh, in the Munich area, yeah. making some beautiful lager. Uh, but yeah, we, we want to, we're going to have open fermenters as well. So we'll have two 15 barrel open fermenters in their own room okay. uh, for fermenting all of our lagers there in Cedar Rapids. So nice. we're super excited about that. Doing um, a little dovetail action looking at, uh, yeah. Exactly. And, and uh, for better and, and worse, some other and some others as well but for yeah. better yeah, cohesions making some yep. nice open fermented stuff out by denver um but for better or worse they are very much on display to the tap room so when you walk in there you can they're it's all glass around there so you're gonna be able to see yeah, so every brewery is on display in one of our tap rooms but this one i think the first one they have you have exposure to the outside so you can see full glass looking in from the sidewalk and then you get two two sides of the brewery the only one that's not as backs up to the kitchen it's basically on three sides you can see it on three sides so it's our first one that will be that that shown off let's put it that way okay yeah you both seem a little nervous about this well i just i mean i'm kind of joking because it's from a brewer perspective we need to keep it extremely clean all the yeah. time because we're on display so there's that um i you know i think uh, generally from a, a, a process standpoint we're excited for the opportunity to brew some open fermentation lagers and then honestly as i talk to other brewers that have some open fermentation uh, you know some of the bigger guys the russian rivers and the sierras yeah they really like fermenting some of their higher gravity stuff in open so oh yeah we'll, we'll probably mess with that at some point too but um i'm reminded of there's a brewery at walt disney world um and the boardwalk and it's the name will come to me it, it might be like Big River or something like that, but it's on the Disney boardwalk uh, near the beach club and near Jelly Rolls and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but that, it's a little brew pub that's there. And Rich Michaels was the, the brewer there for a very long time. And then he went to, I think he was at FX Matt or Utica. Or he was one of those places and some other places. Um, but they, they had him work shifts in the evening uh, so that he was cleaning at night so that uh, he could be spraying down the windows uh, with the hose as opposed to mashing in and being done by 8 a.m. Uh, he was there at 8 p.m. basically for the show of the whole thing. Um, I'm not trying to give you guys ideas for your brewers being like, it's, it's guess what? You're going to be working. Yeah, you're going to be working the seven to midnight shift. And <laughs> we want to see those hoses you on those glass. You can those animatronic <laughs> things. You're just going to be back there and people yeah. are just dancing. Is that a rat? Yeah. <laughs> Get some old Chuck E. Cheeses and just put them back there. And I, just, we had raspberry and Chuck E. Cheese. That'd be that same, okay. that same, uh, that it, same speed. It happens in Iowa City. Our production brewery in Iowa City, the <laughs> brew house is on display to the tap room. And so it, it happens just because we're brewing most of the day and into the evening there. But I have definitely scared a child to cry in because I was I, trying to be funny and spray him with yeah, the hose across the window. Yeah, hit, the, hit, the, hit the window. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, uh, some kids love it. Other kids are scared to death. Yeah, you, might, you can scare kids. Those too. are the kids <laughs> that are cool with it that are allowed to go to breweries. The ones who cry lifetime ban yeah yeah. you know and their parents too (laughs) make every parent drive everybody in front of it yeah more in a moment 
But first, this message. Customers are rushing to your store. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it a <clears throat> real POS? You need Shopify for retail. Shopify's sleek, reliable POS hardware takes every major payment method and looks fabulous at the same time. With Shopify POS, you can accept credit cards, mobile payments, and every other major payment method, all with low fees and transparent pricing starting on day one. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash drink beer. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash drink beer to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash drink beer. And now back to the conversation with Andy Joint and David Moore. Uh, I want to switch gears just a little bit because of the restaurant component, which I'm really fascinated about. And... Dave, we were talking about this beforehand of just the hospitality element to it. And over and over and over, I keep hearing, you know, from folks like, well, nobody wants to work in the hospitality industry or, you know, turnover is so great. And, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're constantly losing folks. And then I come to a place like here where you have a staff and you're building out and you're bringing in new staff all the time. The argument that I've heard on on the pro side of things is, well, then treat your staff well and you'll retain them. And this doesn't have to be a temporary gig. Like you can actually make a career out of hospitality. And, and, and you all seem to be focusing on that. And I wonder if you can just sort of drill that down a little bit. Yeah, uh, happy to. Yeah, for us, I mean, the growth side is is tied directly to the people, right? So uh, with capital, we have opportunities all the time. We got capital, we have, you know, we everything could go into play, but... If we don't have the right people there, then there's we're just, it's just not going to happen. Um, and it's you know it's the the, the founder right he he started working in the restaurant when he was you know what twelve thirteen you know he was super young. His mom ran a restaurant. He was part of it. Um, he made it in his career. I think for him, you know, obviously, I think if you can show to your to your to your original question within the with the employees themselves, you know, we dealt a lot with. Um, well, I'll, I'll work here until I find my real job, right? We have, we have tons of college kids. Uh, we're uh, our, uh, second locations in Iowa City. We had tons of kids from University sure. of Iowa. Looking for a couple right. bucks in their yeah, pocket. Yeah, yeah exactly. makes sense. They'll do school. And, and when they finish school, like, I'm going to go get my real job. But they, they fell in love with hospitality. And for us, if we can prove to them that, you know, this this is a career that you can make, and they can see a growth where maybe they don't necessarily want to be uh, a server. Maybe they want to be, you know, be a GM or go into the brewery or work on the packaging or work into marketing, work into our design, work in our, you know, on our websites. Um, with the much gro- growth that we have, we can show them a growth pattern. We can lay out with them like, hey, we see a lot of potential in you. Here's what the next five years could look like. You know, does that interest you? Um, and then there's just something that's like, I want to be, I want to work in the prep. I'm a, I love being a prep cook. This is what I want to do. But can I get insurance? Can I get time off? Can I get these things? Right? Yeah. And Which is not me, a conversation that comes up a lot. Not a lot. No. You know? no and for I us, mean, there's like, desires, but there's also, 100%. if you bring that up, it's going to be like, <laughs> okay, there's the door. Yeah. And we don't want to do that, especially, I mean, the ones that you want to keep, right? And the ones that you want to, and maybe, maybe they don't feel that way now, right? Maybe they don't want to, I'm, I'm good with this. But in three years, I might change. You know, something in their life may change, but like, I, th- I think I do want to be a manager. Maybe I want to do something else type deal. Maybe I want to be the head guy in the kitchen sometime. Uh, but until then, yeah, we, you know, we offer those benefits uh, to them. We, and, we, and we constantly work on other benefits, 401ks we're trying to work on, right? Uh, we have an employee assistance program we're really proud of that helps, uh, helps our employees, whether it be um, their, their, their parents have to go into uh, uh, hospice and they don't know how to handle that type deal, to they're buying their first house and they don't know how to, how to look at a contract type deal. And, and uh, there's there's mental health. There's you know uh, there's all these things that could, that come into play. This type of program for us and for them it grows with them, and that's what they want. We want them to grow with us. And if that path chooses you know to where yeah, I think I want to be a GM. I want to be a uh, chef de cuisine. I want to be a head brewer. I want to do these things. Um, you know they got the core values down. That's why they're still there. If they have the core values down. There's always there's always space for them. There's always uh, a place for them to go. And then the growth of you know that kind of feeds itself, right? More people are interested in growth and doing more things allows us to grow and do more things. So as long as we keep that interest with uh, with the employees and, and staff, and and then it, we obviously have to attract new new talent all the time. 
Uh, so when we, you know, we put a job application out, we want to see a bunch come in. And Cedar Rapids, we've had really good success. We had we opened up for bars and, and servers, and I think we had like 150 uh, applicants, hmm. right? Um, people talk about, you know, uh, especially in the kitchen uh, is a prime example. Kitchen being hard to staff and cutting hours or like, hey, bar's open, but the kitchen's not type deal. Right. Um, you see, unfortunately, you see a lot of that. Here, we, we take great pride in that, in that kitchen. Ben Smart, who he mentioned earlier, is a huge draw for that. Um, he's an unbelievable leader. And, uh, and for him, um, he draws in that talent and develops. And we got so much talent. Des Moines, we built up for a year. We're stacked in there. Absolutely stacked in that kitchen for people who could, who could easily go run another restaurant themselves but are staying here, right? Because they want to they take that next seat at one of the next locations we got coming up type deal. And we're excited for that. That pumps us up. And it gives us the confidence to go out and get a little further away, go, you know, leave the state. Go, you know, maybe just instead of being just in Iowa, maybe we go, we go to different states. It's very exciting for us. And it's exciting for them. They get to think about maybe moving and doing these things. We talked about, you know, being here in Des Moines. We had about 22 people. Uh, it took either a lateral shift or a promotion uh, to come here, and that's a great moment. We get to promote all these people and do all that, and then and then you get to promote the people that's, that backfill them in Iowa City and Solon and other locations. Yeah, um, and then we get to draw in new talents. We got new people in here as well that are, uh, are are doing great, doing great work. What about on the brewing front as well, right? Because I I feel like that's always there's so many small small breweries out there that if somebody is hired as an assistant brewer or even a head brewer they're going to hit a ceiling pretty quickly. And if somebody's going to stay at a thousand barrels or less a year and somebody has real ambition, um, they're not going to be able to, to, to stick with it. But what is, is it similar on the brewing side of things? Yeah. I mean, you know, the growth presents a lot of opportunities that we can, that we put in front of that team. So, you know, we've, we've had some people, we, we've got a guy that, that runs the brewery here in Des Moines, Keaton. Um, he was, he was at some, he was at Widmer. He was at Freem for a while. He came back to join us at our production site and, you know, he helped us kind of optimize and get better at what we did there. And then he was really, really excited for the opportunity to run his own spot. And so we were able to get him, you know, he's got a beautiful little brewery here in Des Moines that he runs and him and Peyton are making some great beers back there. And it's just a cool opportunity. And, you know, we're having that again with Cedar Rapids where we're putting in a really cool brewery. We've got a, a 10 year industry vet and in Chris Flanker, who who was brewed at a couple different spots. And, and he's going to get to run his own spot there in Cedar Rapids as well. And then for, you know, for a lot of the production team, that's just it's a different environment, you know, for a lot of brewers that haven't been in production, it is a very different environment to operate in than just like a brew pub concept. But they now with, with, we're going to have another production site in Iowa city as well. So like, it just presents a lot of opportunities to learn, to cross train, um, to work with a really dynamic team. And, and so I think it just, you know, sometimes people talk about their job and it's the same stuff, different day. And <laughs> for Big Grove over the last seven, eight years, it, it has not been the same stuff. It's a different day, but it's always changing and a lot of new opportunities. Yeah. Um, and it also must bring a lot of new ideas to the table as well. I mean, you have the pilot facility, you have, you're, you're able to run trials, you're able to really try to, you know, dial in things before um, you scale them up. The I, I'm terrible on remembering beer names but the, the citrus surfer there. citrus surfer yeah, yeah. Um, which is delightful and it's 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 a lot of fun but like you were testing that out for a long time you know yeah. you can get input i imagine from a multitude of brewers yeah we had a couple of our brewers and the tap room and the tap yeah and our customers our customers are giving feedback as well but yeah we got a couple of different brewers we had you know our R&D brewer was working on it at our Solon brew pub making seven barrels at a time the Des Moines guys were working at it here uh, in Des Moines making 10 or 20 barrels at a time and we're just uh, it allows us to rapidly get to what we want for the finished product there for sure um and i mean that that also helps right because you're 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 having this exchange of ideas and there's a common goal among all of the places right there's not necessarily competing against one, one another. I mean, it's it maybe competing in a good way though, right? Where it's like, we're all trying to reach the same goal and we're trying to figure out different ways to do it. And you know, everybody wins, I think that way. But I think too, just from a team concept, you know, we've got, I think about 24 people on the production team and then uh, two over here in Des Moines, but it's, it, we are a pretty open concept as far as ideas. It's not just like, you know, it's not my way or the highway or, or there's nobody just saying, this is how we're going to do everything. It's very open. So yeah. if somebody at any level comes to us with an idea, we're always down to pursue that and see what it does for us. So the big thing for us too, I mean, look at the size of our spaces, right? This, yeah. this, this is a very large space. Iowa city is probably 
twice the size as this space. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's a very large space. Our patio is an acre, yeah, for example. So it's a lot of people. So for us, and then uh, most of our concepts would be more like Des Moines here. But they're bigger spaces, which means a lot, we, we, invite, we want a lot of people. We need a lot of people. So we can't be too specialized in one thing, right? Yeah. We can't be too niche But that said, we can, we can kind of be niche in a different way in the sense of hitting a bunch of different beer styles, a bunch of different food styles, because we want to attract as many people as possible. The big thing for us, you know, the brew, brew, uh, model is, you know, removing barriers is what we call it. So uh, we, we're, like, we're a perfect spot for like 30 people. You know, we, we can mush tables. We can do all these things. We're a perfect spot for like 30, 40, 50 people. That's our bread and butter. And, but in that 30, 40 people, right, you're going to have a vegan. You're going to have somebody who's gluten-free, somebody who doesn't like beer. Yeah. Right? You're gonna have somebody who only drinks wine. Somebody, there's a lot of things that we've purposely removed all of those beer, barriers very intentionally. And, uh, and so for us, that, that, that's been huge success for us. And uh, we'll continue to do that. But the, the beer styles as well, because you, you can find those guys, people that want that certain kind of beer. I can't think of the name of the beer that you were asking about uh, uh, when we were in the oh, cooler there, the route beer. Oh, route yeah, beer, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> but we can have, yeah, we, can, we can do those things. Sure. Yeah, and, and, and we're a big enough space where we can, we can get those people to come in and, and have their, that that one beer they really want, well, and uh, we need to do that. From the brewer perspective too, like during summer when patios are in play, uh, both locations have big patios. So like we can turn and burn some batches of beer pretty quick. So like if we're brewing, you know, little batches at the satellite facilities and put them on tap at one of the big tap rooms, like they can be gone like yeah. that. And so it means we're brewing a lot. We get to do a lot of fun stuff, and, and you know it's going to sell quickly, or hope it's going to sell quickly, and you can brew again. So uh, as we are now in November, uh, it's stout season. Uh, which you guys have also made a name for yourself in this state with your big boozy stouts. Um, I'm wondering about the approach that you've taken to evolving those stouts over time. Yeah, I mean, so we make really two big ones. Uh, Richard the Whale Mm -hmm. is our our upcoming release here that will take place in December. Uh, it's been with us about 10 years now. So it is, it has changed quite a bit from the early days, you know, um, the beer that influenced that a lot of that change was a beer that we make called velvet. Uh, and velvet was kind of our first foray into extended boil times on our beers. And so once we started to see some of the results of that, we started to integrate that into our, our Richard, uh, creation as well. And just, you know, Trying to get that mouthfeel, trying to get that just big, you know, a huge chewy malt flavor, um, and we love the way that translate translates. It barrel ages very well. Yeah, it takes adjuncts very well. Yeah, so it's evolved quite a bit over the years. Um, we like where it's at quite a bit. Uh, we're get we're also getting. We've been a little compressed for like barrel storage storage area, so like uh, a lot of our barrels have been a year or less of aging time, and we we turn them and 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 sell them and move on to the next year's edition but now we're actually keeping some barrels around we're getting some 18 to 24 month aging times in the barrel that we can blend together for the for the final edition that's fun yeah um you were talking before though about the tap rooms also being a great place you know to to find out what drinkers want what what customers want have you seen a shift in stout preferences in the last couple years it's, I mean, uh, to me, it's a little bit harder to tell. It feels like there's a little bit less of the, I guess, uh, hype, you know, uh, around those as far as just the got to get this line up and we're going to be overnight to get this beer kind of feel. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's more, I don't know if people want more approachable or just, I, I'm not sure where it's at, but it does feel like it's changing pretty quickly. Yeah, we've also consciously made it easier, though, too. Like, pre-orders. Okay. Right? You don't have to worry about not getting your beer. Okay. Yeah, you know, there's... So, I think some of it was kind of driving. We, we looked at it as more of a customer customer experience and how we did it as well. In the sense of, we, we went to a, a beer release, right? You stand in line, and then you, you go stand in line, <laughs> right? And then you, you get your package, and you go stand in line for your... It was one of those things where you just kept standing in line, and like... Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, here, to, I'm, here, to, I'm here to go. Right. right. And, and we really took that approach with it, and we really made it customer centric, hospitality forward in the sense of you're going to wait in line to check in one time. After that, it is choose your own adventure. You want to go get your pour? You want to go get your? We had an unbelievable brunch. Do you want to go do this? You know, Richard for us in particular, right, is, is a showcase of all of everything we do. Right, is, we do everything at the highest highest level, and um, and that includes the hospitality. It also includes the food as well. We have a great brunch. 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit maybe about the dinner we do as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Amakazi style, the 18 course dinner we do, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's bananas, right? And we, the tickets sold out in what, five, less than five minutes this year for that, for that dinner. And it does every year, right? And, and so, but it, that beer, the beer is the center part does it, of that. Does it come with a hammock afterwards? Like it just. <laughs> it's, it's usually a three hour. For a couple, for a couple people there, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. It's a good time though. It's amazing. Like we, we literally put the chefs on stage that night and they're preparing and, and plating food in front of the diners and kind of talking to everybody there about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And it's a, it's a really fun time. Yeah. They, they're super. Yeah. We literally, yeah. Tables on here where you have stadium seating, right? Everybody's got high top tables, and everybody's looking. You know, you're looking down. We got a uh, GoPro looking down on the on the plating table, and and uh, and, the, and the chefs are bringing are bringing the food to uh, uh, to everyone there, and and uh, it's it's a big deal. It's a huge deal for uh, for that. And like I said, and then people just you know they they love the experience. They come in for you know they they tent the night before still, and and uh, they do all their things and and, uh, and bottle shares and, and, and good times and. Even when it's negative 30 or whatever in terrible weather, they still do it. You yeah. Know? And, um, but there's a, there's the whole a weekend's a great experience. There's a group that's been getting Richard the Whale tattoos every December or, well, before every December. So they're out of, I think they're in the Omaha area, but they, they've got whale tattoos. They've been. Wow. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, it's amazing. Really intense. It's, yeah. That is intense. It's intense. <laughs> but it's also a testament to the experience, right? Because it's not just what you're putting in a bottle it's not just what you but it's the it's the overall package that you're giving to yeah, folks it's our way of thanking them as well right i mean there's a lot of beer you can you can go pull and, and, and go to and, and spend money and yeah and this is our way of thanking them right giving them a great experience and you know allowing the beer to speak for themselves and and not getting away that not being sore without be doing it in front of the uh take away from the beer but you also don't give them a bad experience which then just, just uh, diminishes their experience with the beer itself so that's that's super important for us. We put that on a pedestal. It, it, it seems like the beer experiences and, and COVID didn't help with, with any of this. But even before COVID fully hit, with all of the breweries that were out there, it was just, OK, we're just going to go to tap rooms and hang out. And some of the beer dinners that used to be popular went away. Festivals have been struggling in the last couple of years, um, even before the pandemic and certainly now uh, where we are after. Um, but those experiences are still, I think, wildly valuable oh they're vital yeah 100 percent. vital yeah i think uh, for us it's it's a it's that connection with 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 that customer right in a very intimate moment right you're, you're literally ingesting you know putting you know into your body uh it's a huge it's a huge deal uh, and uh, and for us we take that yeah that, that's our time to shine right and, and like i said there's so many choices out there and there, you have to you have to thank the customer right and i think some of the i might like put a label on all festivals and all beer dinners but i think people took advantage of the fact well you know it's always busy so it's going to be this way we sure. can kind of do what we want to do and and, and that may be your your experience is not the top of our mind and uh i would say is for us uh, that's been our biggest success is keeping that that pretty mindful and the, that customer's experience how do they feel when they walk in when they feel, feel when they leave right and you know we, we joke about literally running after people say goodbye like that that's literally the expectation <laughs> that you should be running to go say goodbye to somebody and uh, I'm a, you know, I would never say we're I don't perfect, know. As, right? as somebody from New Jersey, like that would that would really freak me out. Of just <laughs> you know, it's just like no, yeah, just like, like, I, leave yeah. me alone. Yeah, no, it's Midwest nice. I know exists, and I just uh, I'm not. It's jarring. If, yeah, heard, yeah, if somebody heard. like running after me and, and saying goodbye, it's like, what, what do you want? You like, feel like, threatened. What, yeah, I do? I, what I do? What I do? Absolutely <laughs> feel threatened. A hundred percent feel threatened. Um, but I love that that Noted. exists. I think, I think it's, I think it's a great journey for you guys. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a really, it's, it's a nice thing. Um, I want to talk very briefly just about, um, climbing kites and the future of beverages outside of beer and, you know, how all of that fits in with the larger hospitality theme that you all have going on. Yeah. I would say, you know, for us, it was an understanding of a non-alcoholic option. Right. And it, it took me a while to get my, my head around it. Cause I always think uh, non-alcoholic with no buzz sure. as well. Right. No escapism, no, just you're there type deal. Yeah. And I think even it works for those, you know, that, you know, they're an alcoholic or whatever else there's moments where you, you, people don't want to drink alcohol for whatever myriad of reasons. Sure. Right. Uh, it could be, you know, like I said, the health could be mentally, it could be a lot of things. And for us, again, I go back to removing barriers. This is another barrier that, you know, that's kind of come up and, and now we want to take it down sooner and later. And for us, this gives our customers an option to, again, imbibe and, 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 and 
get some escapism uh, without drinking alcohol. And uh, uh, we we saw the product. We 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 thought that that's exactly the, the format it should be in. Um, and it, it kind of fit our mantra. It's what we're trying to give to our customers. And and again, bring all those that want to. Even if you don't drink alcohol, period, you're still welcome here. Yeah. Right? You know. And uh, uh, it, it was a no-brainer for us. Absolute no-brainer. And. It's it's very popular, very popular. It's done well as well. Like I say, economically, it's it's not a benevolence thing. It's you know, it's it makes a lot of uh, fiscal sense as well. Yeah. From the brewing standpoint, like where do you see some of these beverages fitting in with the work that you all have been doing? Yeah, I mean, it's it's feels like there's a lot of uh, a lot of people seeking for some different options. You know, they people love beer and they love drinking beer, but there's also sometimes you know we're all trying to manage our way through it and figure out what what the best approach is and i think for me for a lot of my staff we've talked about climbing kites being a really nice little add to the mix where like you know maybe i won't have that next beer i'll just i'll have a climbing kites and kind of just chill for a little bit and then maybe have one more you know sure. kind of just using it that way um i think yeah i think it fits really well um and i think it fits within a, a, a happy beer lifestyle so i'm excited about it myself awesome um I've been asking folks on the show for a while now the green door question, which uh, the premise is on The Good Place, the television show, in the fourth season, they introduced this concept of a green door where you can walk through it and be uh, anywhere you want, doing whatever you want. And so if we had a green door on our plane of existence and this conversation ended and you could walk through it and be in any pub or any brewery anywhere in the world, where would you want to go, who would you want to be with, and what would you like to be drinking? Dave, how magic are we talking like anybody? Sure, like past, prior. Yeah, live your dream. This will this will be sentimental. I'll do sentimental. I would say my uh, my grandfather. I never met him, but he was a bootlegger. He was uh, a guy who made shine and everything else. And he's the only dude I actually look apparently looked like in my family. Okay, uh, and then he uh, his sister owned a uh, it's a Belgium village. Uh, basically in downtown Moline and uh, she owned a boarding house there and so that was the first bar in the family and no one's, no one's had a bar since since me there so I'd, I'd say those two places drinking would be a good Belgian, a Belgian ale that would be in let's say 1940s oh man I mean countless there, but yeah. yeah one of those okay yeah. Yeah, that's a good tough question I you know I, I don't know for some reason I get drawn to political figures um for some reason, Winston Churchill just seems like a guy you might want to have a whiskey with or a beer with. Sure. Um, but yeah, I would. I don't know if uh, if if I could take Winston to Sharon Rom and drink some of those lagers there. I would. That would be absolutely amazing. I would. I think we'd have a lot of fun. I like that. <laughs> um, guys, thanks for the hospitality. Thanks for uh, sharing the big growth story, and thanks for. Um, all of the insight. This is, it's cool to be here. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, John, uh, appreciate talking to you. Thanks for coming in. If you need to reach me, you want to get in touch with questions, comments, guest suggestions, et cetera, you can email me at John Hall at allaboutbeer.com. That's J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L. That's also a reminder to visit allaboutbeer.com where you can check out the podcast page, the merch page, and can read great new content as well as the archives going back to 1979. Don't forget, follow All About Beer on social media at All About Beer. And if you're interested in supporting journalism in the beer space, email us at info at allaboutbeer.com or simply go to patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. Speaking of advertising, here is a quick word from this episode's sponsor. Shopify has already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. (laughs) Shopify POS is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash drink beer. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash drink beer to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash 
drink beer. One more time, don't forget All About Beer is a podcast channel now. Just search and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. Steal This Beer has new episodes every Monday. The BYO Nano podcast comes out on the 15th of every month. And as for this show, Nate Schweber does the music, Jeff Quinn designed our logo, and I'm John Hall. New episodes release every Wednesday, and that's when I'm going to be back again to drink beer and to think beer.